electron microscopy. All righty. So you want to turn off those lights yes. for the slides? There we go. OK, so we're going to be talking about electron microscopy in uh, art, which is all located in Yates 101 as far as it works. Uh, the staff is me, Rebecca's here in the corner, and Bradley is here. Uh, Rebecca really does most of the SEM stuff. Bradley is our graduate assistant who knows biology. And so we actually have added that capability, which is tremendous. So and yeah, what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit about what we have in the present facility, which is the uh, SEM JUL 6500F and the TEM, the JEM 2100F. And then uh, starting in about a week and a half, we get a loaner microscope, which is the SEM, uh, uh, the 700HR. That's going to be installed starting December 18th. That will not have all the capabilities of the new one we're getting, which will be in June of 2024. And we'll sort of talk about that. So the stuff that I'm going to talk about, the present facility is stuff we've done. And almost all the images, I think everything is stuff that we actually have done. So we haven't borrowed or stolen from anybody. The stuff in the future, obviously, uh, we go from what is coming and from brochures and so forth. And then we'll finally finish up with a little discussion of where we might expand, hopefully, the TEM in the future. So for those of you that aren't totally into the picture, why do we use electrons? And obviously the big thing is electrons have a smaller wavelength. And so that gives us the capability of seeing smaller structures. And in today's nanotechnology, that gets to be significantly crucial. Anyhow, this is sort of an interesting, way too busy slide to show you. But you can see we're down into the 10 to the minus 11, 10 to the minus 12 meters uh, for imaging with the, the uh, microscopes. The TEM has a factor of about 10 better than the SEM. So here's what we have down. We have the 6500, which if you've been in the lab, you've seen both these tools. If you haven't been in the lab, we welcome you to come down and visit and uh, learn about and use both the tools. Hopefully what I do today is if you haven't been using the microscopes, what's your appetite as far as where you could go with it? So here's the SCM. This is your starting microscope. And you can read the slide as well as I can. But the big key is the magnification. We go up to about 300,000, although that's sort of pretty impractical with our present microscope. Probably 100,000 is more practical. The spatial resolution we have achieved, two nanometers, that's not easily available. So normally it's not quite that good. But anyhow, that gives you an idea. That's sort of the specs of where it goes. Big thing here is the sample size, about four inches in diameter by a centimeter thick. So it's a big, you could put your iPhone in, uh, which obviously when we get to the TM, you can. So there's a difference there. And the sample has to be solid, metals, minerals, particles, polymers, biological. For the most part, the SEM that we have now, we just do secondary electron imaging, and I won't go into the physics of that, but that images the top 20 to 50 nanometers of the surface. And with the one we have presently, we can do secondary. We can do a thing called stem and stem scanning electron uh, transmission electron microscopy in the SEM. EDS, which is elemental imaging and mapping. EBSD, which is electron backscatter diffraction and lithography. So it has quite a bit of capability. Here are just a couple images that are from the present SEM. The one on the left is a bug. Most of you aren't interested, but when we get uh, kids in from grade schools in particular, they love bugs. So that's sort of where we go with them. They could care less about gold and carbon. 
but they could they like bugs and showing the bugs eyes and the tentacles and all that the kids love that so it's a good thing we did do some work with bugs but we don't do much with bugs anymore and most of the time people say get the bugs out get not get the bugs in and then the sample on the right which is the gold nanoparticles on carbon is sort of the standard that's used in the industry for resolution check and so you can see the difference in imaging there and this is done uh, for a resolution check we can do eds spectra which the top image here is shows uh, and it basically does the elements from beryllium up to wherever you want to go we've done rare earths we've done a transition translation transitional metals and so forth so you can get up to uranium uh, i don't actually we have done some uranium i think so you can actually see uranium so that's the kind of spectra you get the big problem that you run into here is people take those numbers that are up on the right hand side there of quantification they believe that because the computer spits it out it's good and it's not but uh, i think if you think you have strong medium weak and very weak and you're happy with that level of concentration then you're pretty satisfied the bottom slide here shows the ebsd and the uh, mapping of the sample we can scan a sample and it actually pixel by pixel creates an orient a diffraction pattern like you see in the middle of the slide there and that is automatically indexed to what the orientation is and so you actually get an orientation map and a whole bunch of other things you can get from samples here's something that i developed years ago uh, called the uh, transmission why are we how do we get rid of that top thing i wonder i think that's it guess we can't get rid of that it's there so unfortunately anyhow transmission ebsd this was sort of a offshoot of some interest in doing some fine structure analysis which you can't do the standard ebsd is in reflection and so your resolution is probably about 30 to 40 nanometers in diameter when you go to transmission you can get down less than 10 nanometers in diameter and so it's sort of thing we developed and or i developed and it's back in 2008 actually it was developed and everybody said nobody will ever use it well it's become pretty hot topic actually the only requirement here is you have to have a sample that's transparent to the electrons and so you're back into almost a tdm type of sample now we lock this up why are we locking this up technology is great Not moving slides on so don't know why that is that like pinning the corner and bending that side of the block there we go we got rid of that <laughs> ah good okay so so here's an example of what we used the transmission work for. Uh, Aaron Stuckert, who was a student of Ellen Fisher's, uh, was making uh, tin oxide samples, and we did TEM on them, but we also did SEM. And one of the things in SEM was to actually see if we could actually get the orientation of them, which was much easier with the transmission. And so here's just some data we took from her sample so typically on the left is a a pattern that you get and then the indexing is what's on the right so you can actually index these samples so again for any of you that have transmission type samples uh, we can do diffraction on them with the SEM okay now we'll switch to the TEM here again you can read it's 200 kV in general resolution is about one and uh 
0.9 angstroms. Actually, I'll show you pictures that are better than that today. The big thing is the sample size, three millimeters diameter by about two to 300 nanometers thick. And this is the big drawback. Sample manufacturing or making, whatever you want to say, development for the TEM is generally the drawback. And uh, students spend more time making samples than they do analyzing them. Anyhow, again, solid samples by and large. So here's just some standard examples, not standard, typical examples. The top thing is actually was aluminum that I pulled in tension, broke, and we see these little loops. There's no, is there a pointer here? Here's a pointer. Does that work on the screen? Yeah. See these punched out loops here? Those are vacancies. When dislocations intersect, for those of you in materials, you might understand what a dislocation is. For those of you in biology, it's not a broken arm. It's a, it's a defect in the structure. And when they intersect, they create vacancies. These vacancies coalesce and create these loops. And here was an interesting example of just punched out loops from a bunch of dislocations. These are dislocations. For those of you who have no idea what those lines are, those are what's called dislocations, probably edge dislocations for the most part. Here's a high a mag of one of those loops, and we actually did conversion beam in the loop area to show the difference in orientation outside and inside and so forth and so on. So these are things you can do with TEM. That's the real purpose here, not to talk about loops, but we can do defects. Here's actually a cross section of magnetic why is this of magnetic material. And so if you're familiar at all with the diamond like carbon, then you have the cobalt uh, recording media and so forth and so on. And so we were looking at the interface of these, and so we did high resolution work. And so you can actually see the high resolution imaging. Again, the point is to show you high resolution imaging. And then this group over here, these are single wall carbon nanotubes, and they basically group together and form what we call ropes. And so you can see the single wall carbon nanotube. The interesting thing is here, people have, you know, the knock on damage for carbon in a carbon nanotube is about 86 keV, and these were done at 200 keV. So you have to get in and get out pretty quickly, but you can actually get the images. And then the bottom uh, slot down here is actually the, the diffraction from this, where we actually put a small beam on it and did diffraction. So again, the whole purpose here is to show you a cross grouping of samples. Here's high resolution. And if you take my class, which we'll talk about at the end, you will be able to do images like this, I hope. Uh, and you can get gold. And so if it's oriented correctly, you can get single crystal films. And here's, uh, this is actually a hexagonal structure over here where you can see the different layers in the hexagon. So we do high resolution. This is in our microscope. So this is not one that you have to go to Oak Ridge to do. You just walk downstairs in Yates here and we can do this for you. Here's some examples. Well, this is an interesting one here. If you take a look, it's the same as that other sample, except you see in between, I keep losing the mouse here, and I get scared. And I'm gonna knock something from the right mouse, there you are. If you look in between, you can see dots, which we suspect, or I suspect, are due to, it's a face center cubic structure. And so these would be atoms halfway down the column as opposed to at the top. Here's gallium nitride. This is work I did when I was over at NIST, and we were doing gallium nitride. Then we were intercalating it with indium, so you formed indium gallium nitride, and you can see the difference between these structures here. Here's some nanoparticles that we did here. I think this is one of Chris Ackerson's students who was making uh, gold nanoparticles. And what you see here is this tremendous capacity to twin. This is five nanometers. So that's 50 angstroms. So that's pretty small. And, but you see the magnitude of twinning that takes place in these nanoparticles. And then well, I did some work here where we looked at a structure of uh, iron oxide 
And one of the things which people haven't done here, but it's available, you can take your structure, and if you're not quite sure what it is, you can do computer simulation and try to match things up. And so this program's called CRISP, uh, but that we have sort of a modified demo version of it, you can actually match things up with it. For another example, here's strain analysis. So this is back to, again to the uh, indium gallium nitride nanowires where the indium goes in, you get these bands and there's strain there. And when you look at diffraction, you actually see a modification of the diffraction pattern, which by taking the images and then doing a backscatter, back, if you will, imaging of the different spots, we can create a color map. And so you can see here, the green is the gallium nitride, the red is the ingan, where you have indium gallium nitride. So it's a nice way to pick out. This is small structure. These are tiny, as you can imagine. And then for the few of you that might have some interest, here's magnetic imaging. Uh, I love magnetic imaging, and we can actually see the domain walls. Here's cross ties, so forth. So we can do magnetic imaging. Again, Lorenz, it's called Lorenz. This is a Fresnel type of contrast is also a Foucault type of contrast, but you can see the domain walls. And as you change the field, these domain walls move around, which is good. This is interesting for people interested in magnetics. Okay, here's again some STEM imaging now. All that was TEM. This is STEM. And so here we have uh, a silicon structure that's oriented to 110 and when you see that you can actually see the silicon dumbbells here and so that's silicon atoms in the uh inter actually the inter the tetragonal inter -C position and it gives you this dumbbell structure this is the criterion that people use for resolution in stem you can see this is 1.69 angstroms i think or 1.36 angstroms is the spacing so that's actually pretty small and then here's stem of the uh, what we call bright field image and uh, had high angle angular dark field image of gold nanoparticle showing the individual columns of gold you're not seeing individual atoms but you're seeing columns and the scattering the the stronger the scattering the deeper or the longer the column so you can see in a nanoparticle, as you go to the edge, you get weaker scattering because you have fewer atoms in a column. In the middle, you see quite a bit of scattering because that's your thickest part. So STEM imaging, STEM imaging is Z squared, atomic number squared, approximately. It's not exactly squared, but it's close enough for academic purposes. And so you're seeing as you increase Z, you really do get difference in scattering. The big difference, reason for that is in TEM imaging, here's the same structure. This is actually, this is a tungsten oxide from uh, Justin Sampur, Professor Justin Sampur's lab. And so you can see the, sometimes these get hard to interpret the image and you have to do phase contrast, taking multiple images at different defocus, do simulations and so forth much easier to go to stem where you're getting z squared imaging so here you can see where you have heavy columns but bright things you have heavier columns of the tungsten and where you have weaker columns you have less tungsten and more oxygen so it's a lot easier to interpret than this the tm image here's an example which i just shot I actually said are we up to date yeah well, i did this yesterday or the day before, I think. Today, Wednesday, this is Monday. Thing keeps jumping. And so this is an image of the tungsten oxide. And you can see the spacing there. The, the bright spots are about 3.6 angstroms apart. So that the middle column you're seeing there is about 1.7 angstroms on one side and about 1.8 angstroms, 1.9 angstroms on the other side. That's standard. That's our TEM. People spend a lifetime trying to get pictures like that. We can do that. Give me the sample. Go down and do it now. 
Now, the difference here between the right side, that's actually the original image. And then we take that image, we do an FFT on it, Fourier transform to clean up the noise. And then I add the two together to get the picture on the left. So it's sort of improved, but the picture on the right, which is the real image that we took actually shows it. So here again, I would, so this just for comparison, the TEM, which is beautiful, but hard to interpret. The stem, which shows basically the same level of structure, uh, but much easier to interpret. So stem imaging, which again, we have that capacity, is really quite good. And then we have diffraction. Well, what's diffraction? Diffraction, we can do a whole bunch of things. We can do CPET, convergent beam electron diffraction. And the nice thing about that is it shows you symmetry. And if you look here, you see you have two two-fold axes. And so it shows you the symmetry of the 110, which is what you expect. And so you can actually see symmetry in a structure. And it's used quite a bit to see symmetry, to sort out the structure of crystals and so forth. And then we can go to a fun thing. This is Tylenol. Go to your grocery store, buy a bottle of Tylenol, bring it to the lab, we'll crunch it up, put it in a microscope, and you can get diffraction patterns. And actually from this, this has become a big thing in the pharmaceutical industry, is actually taking diffraction patterns from very small crystals, sorting out what the structure is. Big difference here is with X-ray diffraction, you surely can do crystal structure, but it requires a sample that's moderate size, surely microns, and you'd like it bigger than microns if you can. We can go to nanometers effectively and get this diffraction. So the TEM has become a tour de force for nano diffraction. They call it micro ED, micro electron diffraction. And it's become a big uh, tool in the pharmaceutical industry because they don't have to spend a year trying to make a big crystal. They can just take a standard crystal and pop it in the microscope and do diffraction from it. And then on the right, we have gallium nitride. And so here's again the NGAN and three convergent beam patterns from different locations, seeing how sensitive it is to the different orientations and the strain in the sample. So different diffraction techniques. And then here with um, uh, one of the students here, we were doing some metal oxide framework structures, which are incredibly beam sensitive. And they last about a microsecond under the electron beam. So what I had to do was go around and take diffraction patterns initially, which are at the bottom from the MOF, and then afterward the sample did destroy, but the crystallinity did take pictures of where we took the diffraction patterns from to stop. So you can work with very beam sensitive materials. You just have to sort of sort out. It's not as easy as working with a, a piece of stainless steel. And then we have on the right, I have what we call 4D stem. In 4D stem, we can actually form a sub nanometer probe, actually about a two angstrom probe, scan over the sample and get diffraction patterns from each pixel, which are stored. And then we can save all that data. And it's called 4D because you have a 2D diffraction pattern and a 2D image. So it's 4D, yeah, nice word. And so it gives you the capability of, of taking a sample taking diffraction patterns from very small regions and then going back and reconstructing the image. And so we have some, two different structures here. Here's one, and you can see, God, this thing's super sensitive. Here we have, we just took different diffraction patterns from here and here, recreated the image with that diffraction pattern. And then here we took this particle down here, took diffraction patterns from it, took dif different spots, recreated it, and actually this is sort of fun thing, you create a color image, so it looks like a, a Waldo's hat or something like that. But again, we're talking about nanometers, so you can do diffraction from nanometers. That's the point, the purpose, is to emphasize we can do diffraction from really, really small regions. And then here's sort of the consummate type of thing you get. Here's this back to uh, Alan Stuckert's things, Aaron Stuckert's thing. Here's the tin oxides. Here's the TEM image. 
that actually what we had was a central fiber with little feathers off the side. And so we took images of that, took the diffraction patterns, and then came back and with Crystal Maker, we created a model of the diffraction pattern. And so you can actually sort out what you have, what the orientation is, and so forth and so on. So this is all capable. We're all capable of doing that. We did this here. We didn't do this someplace else. So I encourage you. That's TEM. So here's the new SCM. Yay. This is what's coming December 18th. Keep your fingers crossed. Hopefully we don't get a snowstorm and they have a blizzard and they can't get it here for a month after that. That's a typical thing. This is a through the courtesy of JUL. We're getting a loaner uh, because the model, model we're getting, which is what's called the 800, is not available until June. So they're giving us this uh, loaner, which has very similar capabilities, not completely the same. But the big thing is it will have the same operating system. So when you learn to use the microscope, courtesy of Rebecca, uh, you will learn the microscope or learn operating system, which will be the same as on the 800. So you don't have to relearn come June a new system. So you can read the capabilities here. Some of the nice things about this are what I one of the things I really like is that you can go take a picture with your iPhone or with the the microscope itself, optical picture and put your sample in. So if you have multiple samples, you can then take the picture, point and go to them very easily, which is those of you that are using the present 6500 realize if you put multiple samples in, you have to spend a little bit of time sorting out where where you're going with the samples. So with the, what they call the zero mag mode, which we have on the 700, we'll have it on the 800. Uh, you can actually take, like I say, you can take a picture with your iPhone. And for you young people, that's common. For me, oh, I don't do that. Oh, maybe I should try doing that. Never did a pic take pictures with my iPhone, but find out new technology, you learn. The older you get, the more you learn. There's EDS integration. The EDS that's on this is the JUL system, which is 30 millimeters squared. What we have on the 6500 now is 80 millimeters squared, so it's going to, not going to be as sensitive. What we're getting on the 800 is 160 millimeters squared, which is more than twice as sensitive as what we have now. So you'll be a little disappointed in the EDS on the loaner, but you'll be tip really excited about the EDS on the new one. On the right hand side is a big thing which a lot of people are interested, especially the geologist, is montaging. We can actually take multiple images, stitch them together, and do EDS, do imaging, do all sorts of things over quite large areas. And you can see there we're talking about millimeters by millimeters, which you normally don't do in an SEM, but this montaging thing, which is standard on both microscopes. Yeah, this what they call smile view. I love the names. I, these guys must sit in the bar and try to figure out what names they come up with. <laughs> but you have smile view here, which is allows you to take your standard image, which is the one on the middle left, and then you can go and pick out the area you want to do, do EDS on it, do mapping, and then come back and create a report such as you have down below. So this is available on it will be available on the 700. And then on the right are just some standard examples from soft materials. And so you can see there's a, a different types of materials that are all available in the microscope. One of the real advantages of this microscope is it has what we call variable pressure. Normally in the SEM like the 6500, you, you get into high, high uh, pressure, high vacuum, 10 to the minus five Pascal or thereabout. Here you can actually image from somewhere you can go with a pressure of 10 to 300 Pascal. Why do you want to do that? Well, those of you that have soft materials or high dielectric materials, find you have to coat them. Well, if you do variable pressure, you don't have to coat. And so for the most part, these images are from materials that if you didn't have variable pressure, you might have to coat. 
which has its pros and cons and so forth. And those are things for discussion. But the variable pressure really gives you tremendous capabilities of looking at almost anything. Uh, uh, one simple example, you could take a Q-tip, run it around the floor, put it in the microscope, and take a look at it. And so you could actually do analysis and imaging on things that you normally wouldn't even think about putting in the microscope, rocks, dirt, whatever. It, it's, so the variable pressure is quite, quite an advantage. And you can see you can do all, all sorts of types of samples here. So here's the new one that's coming in spring. They say June. We'll see. Anyhow, it has all sorts of capabilities, and you can read the list here of options that are available. The big thing is, look at this resolution up here. That's amazing, actually. And I'll show you a picture of that kind of resolution. So you're going to be able to get resolution, sub nanometer resolution with the microscope. Now, again, that's not trivial to achieve, but you can do it. So uh, capabilities are there. The big thing that this one pushes, again, is variable pressure and the low voltage. So here's some of the advantages, and you can read that. Again, you can take your optical picture with the SEM or your iPhone. The automated operation, I'll show you examples of this. This is really useful for casual users where you can autofocus or want to auto stigmate the image. It has variable pressure. You can do the backscattered, the montage, high sensitivity EDS. This will have the 170 millimeter squared EDS detector. So it will be at least twice as sensitive as what we have now. Uh, it's combined, it's, they're made by the same manufacturer, Oxford. So we'll combine EDS and EBSD imaging for those that get into it. We can do the lithography. And one of the big pushes is low voltage imaging down to 10, that's not a misprint, 10 EV imaging. That, that's substantial. Now, we'll see how well it works, but anyhow, that's what they, they claim. Uh, stem and stem and so forth. And the big thing that I'm excited about is this DPC, differential phase contrast imaging, which actually I'll show you an example at the end of how that can be applied to things that have different electric or magnetic fields. And we will have cathode luminescence, which actually is pretty exciting too. So here again, we have the same thing on the left, this zero mag thing. On the right is what's going to be interesting to the casual user. If you look at the top, you can see that's the left-hand side of the top image there is not very good. You push a button and it automatically focuses the thing. So you can, oh, wow, it's not the microscope. And then you have the other thing is stigmatism. When you see images where there's a, a shape def deformation in one direction or the other as you go through focus, you push the automatic astigmatism button and it stigmates it for you. Now, this works at low mag. I don't know how good it works at high mag, but it's you know, 5,000, 10,000 X. It's going to work pretty nicely, I think, for most people. So this means your learning curve is substantially short for how to do good imaging. Here again, we have the capability of taking the image and going and doing an automatic EDS. We have the same thing. We can write the reports out. Here's for those of you that are theoretically and technically inclined, you can read that quickly, but it shows you the, the type of lens is quite different than what we have in the standard SEM. And it has some interesting capabilities, especially the in-lens backscatter detector will add substantial improvement to capabilities for us. So here's again some examples of samples you can look at with the microscope, which depends on which detector you're using, what samples you're looking at. And so it gives you quite a wide range of samples. On the right-hand side, there's this thing called the AI. Everybody has to have AI in something today. And so they have this AI capability, which gets the best picture you can considering all the conditions. And so it will improve the signal to noise, which the top does, and it will take care of drift correction, which the bottom does. So the AI capability, which I think is a loose use of the word AI, but at least it does improve the imaging capability. Here's 
what I think is going to be fun. You have this quadrant plus detector in the backscatter detector. And so it allows you to take images and get effectively get a, a live 3D type of image. So you can sort of get three dimensional imaging by, and you're taking just those images up on the right or from the four different quadrants. So you have four quadrants, you can individually get the signal from each one separately, and you can collect those together to get what your image looks like. So it's quite a, quite a toy, which I think you'll find very useful. For those of you in solar cells, here's an example of what the solar cell type of thing can be. Now, this is not one that obviously we make. I don't know if we make this kind of stuff here. We don't do, well, we do cat selenide here, cat sulfide, so we can sort it out. Anyhow, it allows you to take the image, do some nice things. We're also getting a um, argon ion surface preparation tool, which will allow you to take your cells, fracture them, and you'll find that the fracture is really rough, do a little bit of polishing, and then smooth it out so you can get these images quite nicely for measuring both elemental and uh, actually we could do defect concentration in these things. There's a whole bunch of stuff you could do. Now we're going to focus on what they love to push. This is j stuff, low voltage imaging. This is 100 volts. We can't do that in the present microscope, but here's imaging at 100 volts. And you think that's good. Look at this. 10 volts. So they actually do imaging at 10 volts. And again, this is for soft materials where you really have problems with them. This is what they say in the Anapur membrane filter. Typically, the problem with these is even if you carbon coat or coat them with gold, when you hit them with the electron beam at 20 kV or 15 kV, you heat them up and they deform. And so the advantage of going to the low voltage is you hopefully preserve the sample in its pristine form. And so you can take images here. But this is amazing to me. You can get images at 10 volts. Uh, I hope we can do this kind of imaging here. Again, this is from their propaganda, so I won't, I don't know. Here's another thing that's really interesting that they have a secondary and a backscattered image at 1 kV. I didn't see anything want to change. I wasn't touching your computer. And so the, what's interesting here is that you're getting a backscattered image on the right at 1 kV. Now, if any of you have done backscattered imaging, which probably you haven't, that's not normally available because the detectors weren't were sensitive, maybe to 5 kV if you're lucky, but you really want to go to 10 kV. So this is 1 kV. So again, low voltage imaging, you can do your secondary and you can do your backscattered. And so you can see, again, backscattered imaging is pretty much, it's not Z squared, but Z imaging. So as you change the atomic number, which you see on the right, uh, you can sort out particles with higher atomic number pretty nicely. Here's a, the standard resolution gold on carbon, 15 kV versus 1 kV. And so this is just really a propaganda picture to show you what you can still do quite good imaging at 1 kV with the microscope. Here's what some of you might be interested in, lithography. And so you can do lithography with this microscope quite nicely. Uh, not that this is great, you know, if, what is it, eight nanometer line widths, I think at the Intel's doing now is eight to 10 nanometer. You're not going to be at that range, but you can get quite nice work. Again, use your PMMA or whatever you're going to use for your, subs your material, your mask, and you can do your lithography. Now, you're not going to do large area. We don't have the registration for that, but you can do small area lithography quite nicely with the microscope. And for those of you that might be interested, here's some biological type samples. Now, this is stem in sample. So this is a transparent type sample, a TEM sample, but a real advantage of doing it in the SEM. And so you can see the negatively stained phage or a cell on the right. Here's another bacteriophage that done at uh, 
You can see stem and stem as you do higher voltage. This is 30 kV, but quite nice imaging. And then you can see carbon nanotubes on the left. Now, notice you don't see the individual nanotube walls. The carbon nanotube, the walls are three and a half angstroms apart. Well, we, you don't have three and a half angstrom resolution. So you see the structure, but you don't see the individual walls. If you want to see the individual walls, you go to TEM. That's easy to do. But you can see that you can at least see the carbon nanotubes. And you see on the right, you can see pretty small nanoparticles. Here's what I hope we can do with this. And this is the sub nanometer resolution in stem and stem. This is seven angstrom resolution, seven and a half angstrom resolution. That's that's a TM like type image. It's just notes the magnitude seven and a half angstrom. That's not two angstroms like I showed you before. But you actually should be able to do the stem and stem quite nicely. Now, this is just one thing I want to pass by your knowledge. Again, the push for the low KV. Everybody says, well, you have to go to 15 and 20 kV to do EDS. Well, if you look at 2 kV there, that covers the periodic table. So you can actually do the periodic table at 2 kV. The difficulty is the overlap of the lines. Now, the K lines are OK, lithium to aluminum. But you start doing silicon, rubidium, you're doing L lines, they're all going to be overlapped on one another, so they have to sort them out, which you can do with simulations, but I'm not sure how good Oxford is at doing that. And then you can do strontium to tantalum, and then you can actually do with end lines, which I've never actually seen much of, tungsten to uranium. But it, it, it really shows you the capabilities that you can do stuff at low KV. Why would you want to do low KV? Two reasons that I can think of. One, you have a high dielectric material, so you know, it charges where you'd like not to code it, and you do get better resolution because EDS comes from the volume that's activated. Well, at low voltage, the volume that's activated is much smaller. And for you geologists, here's a nice sample for you. Here's a sample with the phase map on the left, so it shows you the different phases, and then the chemistry on the right. And this is a fairly large area, so it shows you that we're going to be able to do quite nice uh, mapping and understanding of different samples with the uh, microscope. This is one that I like, the cathode luminescence, something that we don't have now, but we're going to have. And so you can do cathode luminescence. And the top picture is sort of interesting. That's sort of standard. But, but what interests me is... <laughs> This one down here in the bottom, that actually you can see dislocations with cathode luminescence. I did this years and years ago, but at much higher voltage. And so it'll be interesting to see what we can do. Now, what's the material here? It's diamond. What's diamond carbon? So it's low Z. Uh, whether you can do that in high Z materials, not, we'll have to see. But it, the capability is interesting that you can do dislocation defect structures. What I'm looking at potentially, can we see the interfaces in some of your solar materials with cathode luminescence? Because they do luminesce. And so we do have two capabilities of PMT for one goes from the uh, UV to the optical. The other one goes from the optical to the IR. And so uh, most of your, obviously, your solar materials are in the IR. So hopefully we can do that. It'll be interesting to see. And then this is my little baby that I'd like to put. We did this at NIST, actually. We were doing differential phase contrast. You take the quadrant detector. You collect the signals as the beam scans. If you have an internal field, magnetic or electric field, it deflects the beam, and so you can measure this, and we had a much more difficult software thing. Now they have Python. Python is the godsend to imaging. So you can take all this, this Python software written to image this type of data. So you can take the, again, this is 4D imaging. You're getting a signal, and you're doing it with STEM imaging. And you can recreate the structure and the, the field direction and magnitude, if you will, just as you see in the right. And so it's quite substantially interesting for fields. Where I see it for us, not that we do a lot of polymer work, 
but I mean, a lot of magnetic work works for polymers. If you have different different polymers structures with different fields, you might be able to sort them out pretty nicely. So that's going to be a push. We will have the capability. We're just going to have to work with it. So finally, that's with the 700, 800. Here's what we hope to do with the TEM. Uh, the biggest thing we need is we need a faster camera. The CCD camera we have is at least 20 years old in design. And so at least a CMOS camera or maybe a direct electron detection camera. The people doing biology, biological work are really crying to have a faster camera. Uh, Bradley and some of his fellows are developing Serial EM, which is a way of sorting out structures in large area uh, TEM imaging. We'd like to add the cryo capability. Uh, that would be nice to have. I hope we can, uh, which with micro, we can do high tilt at room temperature. So we can do micro ED, we can do tomography at room temperature uh, with plus or minus 70 degrees. There's a, some interest, especially from Amy Prieto's group and in situ electrofluoridic type experiments. Uh, we'd like to be able to do that. Uh, again, back to my thing, I'd like to add a quadrant stem detector so we can do DPC, especially if we have cryo work, then we can do skymarins. So that'd be interesting. And then there's this other thing which everybody calls the new world of volume electron microscopy. That's been around for years. It's just you can do it with a microtome. Now they have this fib in the sense so you can do it there. But it says you can do large volume three dimensional electron microscopy. So that's sort of where we think we'd like to go. And what I'd like to hear is if any of you have things that you'd like to see us do that we don't have. So Finally, little PR for I'm having a class for the spring and so forth. Meet with the students. Check on the ARC TM uh, chat room and we'll, we'll give you more information. But we'll actually have a meeting sometimes after the MLK holiday. And what this is, I'm going to do it this year in two different groupings. I'm going to have session one, which is for those who just want to take images, how to take a picture how to run the microscope, take pictures and so forth. Not interested in analytical work. And then session two, which will be the add-on, will be for those that are interested in analytical work, selected area diffraction, energy dispersive, stem and so forth and so on. And so you can read the rest of it. Anyhow, contact me or uh, look at the ARC website for TM and you'll see when we're gonna have the meeting. Okay, I think that's it. So, and...